No, I have no slides. I think I show enough slides. Anybody who's been in my class will have complained about too many slides. And uh, uh, this is a teaching moment, and it's a teachable moment, but it's not a moment for slides. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy that you're here, too. Uh, this is a really good cause, and I'm glad to be part of it. Uh, I regret my title. This is not about Greg Mankiw. Uh, it's about a much more pervasive ideology. The striking thing about economics texts across the board, mainstream economics texts, is how similar they are, not how different they are. Whether they're written by Republicans like Mankiw or Democrats like Bill Bomal and Alan Blinder, or for that matter, Paul Krugman. Uh, the ideology is Republican. It is Democrat. Uh, it is a faith in markets that is unshaken by any encounters with reality. Uh, this was brought home. I realize that some of you were not of age in 2004, but in 2004, I said this is not about Greg Mankiw, but uh, the proof of the pudding is in the exceptions. Uh, Greg Mankiw was then the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. And um, at one point, he put his foot really deeply into his mouth. They had to, many stitches to sew it all up because he tried to justify outsourcing of jobs on uh, the grounds of comparative advantage. This was just like Ricardo's trade in wine and uh, uh, cloth. And he got himself in a lot of trouble because even some Republicans represent districts where there are workers who'd lost their jobs to outsourcing, and uh, they were all over him. His only defenders, as a columnist for the New York Times noted, uh, were his fellow economists who all leapt to his defense. Didn't matter, Democrat, Republican. It was economists against everybody else. I followed the... Um, flap about the walkout from Act 10. Uh, I really liked the innocent defense by a student who not this year's class, but last year's class, who defended uh, the um, ideology of Act 10. She said, the class is about pure economic efficiency. <laughs> ideology comes into play when we determine how to balance efficiency with social equity. Well, Mankiw uh, said the same thing in an interview with NPR shortly after, but he didn't say it as succinctly. He didn't say it as well as this young woman did. Uh, but the point here is that this is the, a mainstream ideology. It's not Mankiw's ideology. Mankiw is perfectly right when he says that he writes, he's, his text is a mainstream text and his course is a mainstream course. Economics is about efficiency, and politics is about value judgments. I have a different view. Ideology pervades economics. This is not a disease that the other fellow has to which I am immune. Uh, we all have ideology. We can't navigate the social world without ideology. Uh, and the difference is whether you're up front and you recognize your ideology and you admit of other ideologies, or you pretend that you're talking about something which is uh, as unideological as the apple falling uh, from the tree. It's as ideological to define economics as being about efficiency as it is to define economics as being about why the 1% has 40% of the wealth uh, in this country. It's almost a decade now that I've been offering an alternative course to uh, Act 10, and I want to just take a few minutes. I don't plan to use all my time. I hope we have plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion. I just have a few points I want to make. First is to say something about this alternative course that I teach. First thing, and some of you I, I recognize from this course, so you'll know this, the first thing you get in this course is a heavy de dose of mainstream economics. Now, why do you get that in an alternative course? Well, you get it because mainstream economics provides one important way of being in and understanding the world. 
one important way of being in and understanding the world. It's not a straw man to be knocked down. Second thing is you can't criticize something if you don't understand it. The easiest thing in the world for mainstream economists is to dismiss 99% of the criticism because it comes from people who don't know, under, literally don't understand what they're talking about. Third reason is that even if you end up as a critic of mainstream economics, as I do, economics, mainstream economics, is the language of power. And if you want to operate in this world, you have to deal with power and you have to speak the language of power. It's almost like if you're an Indian, you have to speak English. If you're Chinese, you have to, and you want to go beyond China, get, uh, go out into the larger world, you have to speak English. If you want to speak to power, you've got to know economics. That's the first roughly half of the course. The second half of the course are several critiques. First of all, there is a critique within economics. It's a limited critique, but it is a critique. Indeed, it's, it's a, if it were taken seriously, rather than being treated as sort of fine print, it would be a devastating critique of mainstream economics. But there are other critiques, and we spend a lot of, the rest of the course is spent on the other critiques. First of all, there is a critique that comes from considering and taking seriously the distribution of income. Is there a uh, conflict between a decent distribution of income and this uh, paramount uh, uh, emphasis of standard economics efficiency? What can be done about that if there is indeed a uh, conflict? That's the first critique. The second is what I call the Keynesian critique. It is a uh, 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 an axiom or a, a theorem of uh, standard economics that the normal position, the normal tendency of a market economy, if unions don't get in the way and government doesn't get in the way, the normal tendency of a market economy is to full employment. Uh, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, uh, in my judgment, the greatest economist certainly of the 20th century, uh, analyzed this problem in the 1930s and argue, made a different argument, made a critique of standard economics uh, which hones in on this fundamental idea that the normal tendency of the economy is to full employment. That's the third or the second of the external critiques. Uh, another critique that we spend time on is what I call the ecological critique. In my hands, the, ecolo the ecological critique is about how we act sustainably when we do not know, when we do not know how rapidly we are clogging the sinks uh, with the detritus of economic production, economic growth, uh, <clears throat> or how rapidly we are using up natural resources relative to uh, our production and our growth. Especially, especially, how do we act as rich people, as a rich country, uh, in a world in which uh, many people, perhaps most people, lack the material basis of a decent life? Uh, you won't find much on that in standard economics. Uh, and I'll come to uh, more on this point momentarily. The last critique, and the one I think that this movement is picking up on, finally, uh, is what I call, uh, perhaps a little grandiosely, the foundational critique of economics. It's about uh, how uh, the economy bolsters or undermines uh, solidarity, how the economy bolsters or undermines community, uh, a subject, again, about which economics has nothing to say. But that tells you more about economics than it does about uh, this problem. For example, for example, just one example. As many of you know, uh, the ratio of the pay of the CEOs of our uh, corporations, major corporations in this country, and the average workers in those corporations has gone from a factor of 20 in the 1970s, or the, the end somebody was talking a minute ago about the golden age of education. I came in on golden age, and I thought he was going to be talking about the golden age of the economy, but anyway. Uh, the 1970s was kind of the end of that golden age when 
uh, productivity went up and wages went up and everything sort of went up in harmony. Uh, and at that time, the ratio of the average pay of CEOs was, to average workers was a factor of 20. Now, some of you might think that's a bit unseemly. Uh, but in the 90s and the first decade of, uh, of this century, it went up to somewhere in the 200s. Okay? Uh, so that does have, I think, I would argue, and that we need an economics which can argue, uh, undermines community, undermines solidarity. It's just one example, just one example. This hardly exhausts, this is what we do in my course about cri cri criticizing economics, standard economics from different viewpoints. It hardly begins to exhaust the ways and the standpoints from which you can criticize standard economics. Uh, there's a Marxian critique, a reasonably well-developed Marxian critique of economics. There's a critique based on Catholic social teaching, very coherent, very well-developed. All of these are, 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 the, are potential vantage points from which to criticize standard economics. I make a choice. That's my subjective, my construction of what are the most salient critiques in the first, cent in the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, but the real point here, I think the real pedagogical point here, is that even one critique is really enough to make the point, the essential pedagogical point, that cr criticism is possible, legitimate, and important. That we're not dealing with a body of established truths, uh, but we're dealing with provisional conclusions, provisional answers that come from a particular perspective, a particular way of seeing the world. And let me repeat that I think the standard economist way of seeing the world is one important vantage point, but not the vantage point. It's not the only vantage point. I'm just going to take a minute to tell you a little bit about the, the because I think it's revealing, uh, the trials and tribulations of bringing my course into existence. Um, a major element in this was a student movement. Uh, it was called SHARE. That was the acronym. I was trying to remember what exactly SHARE stood for. It was Students H something or other. But anyway, it was students who wanted a different EC-10. Okay. And I, um, I uh, had my own reasons. I was in the process of formulating a book on this subject, and I thought teaching a course would be a useful way, as it indeed turned out to be, of getting my head together on it. Um, so, you know, our, our agendas coincided. And um, so I decided to bring this proposal to my department. Well, make a long story short, my department rejected this proposal. What I wanted to do was one semester as an alternative to ECT-10's first semester, and then people would go and take the second semester of ECT-10. I thought that was really a good idea, and uh, actually a much more plausible course than the course I actually teach, which tries to do everything in one semester, and people really work their butts off. I do, and so do the students. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the vote was not close, I should say. The vote was... Um, uh, something like 33 to 2. I can't remember the 33 exactly, but it was everybody in the room except me and one other person. Uh, so that other person, by the way, I asked him afterwards why he had voted for the course. He said, look, any, if any senior colleague of mine is stupid enough to want to teach uh, EC-10, more power to you. Good thing. <laughs> okay. um, but, you know, the attitude of my department was well summed up by the former head of EC-10, not Greg Mankiw, but the former head of EC-10, uh, who said, look, there are two kinds of economics. There's good economics and there's bad economics. We do good economics. If you're doing something else, must be bad economics, right? Can't be different, must be bad. Uh, well, I lost that round, but I didn't lose the war because the 
predecessor of the, the Gen Ed Committee, then called the core. Some of you may know this ancient history, but I can remember even when before that, when it was also called the core, because it was first called the core. No, it was first called Gen Ed, then it was called core, and then it was called Gen Ed again. It goes, you know, and pretty soon there'll be another reform and we'll call it uh, the core again. But anyway, <laughs> the predecessor committee, the predecessor committee uh, accepted my course by a unanimous vote. So that tells you something about the difference between the way economists see economics and the way non-economists see economics. I have to say, there was one cogent objection. There was one cogent objection to the course. Uh, and that was that a combination of trying to teach mainstream economics and the critiques was really a lot, just too much for students to get their heads around. I learned the hard way, by experience, that, how, that there was a, a good deal of truth in this. It's really hard for some people because the way mainstream economists think is so alien to the way some people think, anyway, that it's really a struggle. We're talking about Harvard students now. We're talking about you guys uh, and gals. And we're, you know, if, if you have trouble getting your heads around this, imagine uh, people who don't have your privileges and the problems they have getting their heads around. Not everybody, but many. So it's not a, it's not a question of intelligence, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a question of mindset and, and just, you know, ways of being in the world. So for these people, it's a real struggle, the first part of the course. They try to get their heads around this stuff, and then I say, okay, now the critiques. Now I'm going to, in effect, deconstruct and show you what's wrong with. Not that it's a straw man, but I'm going to show you what's wrong with it. So it is hard. It's a hard course, and it's, it's difficult. The problem is, though, when is the right time for criticism? When is the right time for critique? Uh, I'm going for the first time in 40 years to the Allied Social Sciences um, meetings in um, January, and I'm giving a paper on something called National Standards for High School Education okay, in Economics. They're really upfront. What they say is, we're trying here, the final standards, I'm quoting now, reflect the view of a large majority of economists today in favor of a neoclassical model of economic behavior, including strongly held minority views of economic processes and concepts would have confused and frustrated teachers and students who would then be left with the responsibility of sorting the qualifications and alternatives without a sufficient foundation to do so. So you can't do it in high school, right? Because people don't know enough. Okay. So what they get is something, it's a, you know, if you've studied any history, you may know of the uh, attitude of the uh, Catholic Church towards uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, ordinary person reading the Bible in the Middle Ages. Forbidden. Only the cognoscenti. So, no vulgar, no vernacular translations of the Bible, only in Latin, preserve it for the elite. Same thing in economics. It's too hard for the average person, the high school student, they can't do this. Okay? It is hard, no question about it. But it's not right in high school, it's not right in Act 10, right? They, uh, that was the argument that was made. Well, let me tell you something, it doesn't happen in graduate school either. Okay? So the economists are all for critical thinking, just not today, tomorrow. Okay. What would it take to change economics? What would it take to change economics? Well, it does take critical thinking, and it does take uh, new ideas, uh, and, uh, but it takes something else. The most successful critical endeavor in critical economics is Keynes's critique of economics and what's that led to. I say the most successful. It's been a dicey road. After 2008, when a prominent uh, conservative uh, Nobel laureate, indeed, who'd been in the forefront of the attack on Keynes, said, well, I guess in a foxhole we're all Keynesians. Uh, 
but um, that moment passed, okay? So the revival of Keynes is, um, may happen, but not so clear as in those moments right after 2000, the debacle of the financial crash of 2008. But what made the Keynesian critique as successful as it was, was the alliance that was made between the economists who promulgated this critique and the support that they found in a new political movement. In the New Deal, in the, I have more than five minutes. I started 10 minutes late, but that's all right. I won't use the time. OK, I, it's OK. We're, we're not in a lecture mode here, but I'm, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep to this. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, where was it? Yeah. The successful alliance between the new ideas and a new political movement. The New Deal in the United States and its aftermath, social democracy in Europe, that was the political force which made these ideas possible and made these ideas for a time flourish. And it was the backlash against those political forces which uh, meant the death of those ideas within economics. Economics was, when I was a student, in fact, I don't think I would have gone into economics if it hadn't been this way. Economics was a flourishing ground of controversial ideas and intellectual controversy. That's all gone now from mainstream economics. But if the new ideas, if any of these critiques, whether the ones that I teach and I favor and think are important, or these others that I think you could make an equally strong case as being important, whether any of those flourish in the years to come will depend on there being a political movement to which those ideas can be allied. Intellectuals like myself, we plant seeds. We don't know whether those seeds are going to germinate because we have no control about the soil, the weather, the climate. That's the political movement. And you are doing, uh, I was about to say God's work, but uh, I'll say it anyway, but uh, I think maybe you won't take that in exactly the same spirit as I mean it. Uh, but uh, you are doing God's work in providing the uh, ground in which uh, criticism of economics, but much more importantly, the allied notion of the criticism of the economy uh, can indeed flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Justin, you can get. Who is it? I'm oh, sorry. Just <laughs> I give it to you. Thank you. Um, can you say a word or two more about the the conflict, the, the sort of ideological, what you perceive to be the ideological quality of uh, of, of an overfocus on uh, efficiency, I think that's what I understood you to be saying, and and perhaps a word or two about the the nature of your conversations and interactions with your with the fellow you know members of your department. The second is easier than the first because I don't have much uh, interaction with the members of my department, so that's that's pretty easy. We're on you know we're friendly and and uh, this is a very polite place, um, but uh, on an intellectual basis I have very little. Uh, discussion with most of my colleagues. Your first question, your first part of your question was about the overemphasis on efficiency. I, I'm not making that claim. I just, I understood you saying Yeah. That. Yeah, I, I think that's ideological, to say that efficiency is the center piece, that that's what, first of all, it's ideological to uh, claim that that should be the center piece of what economics is about. Um, and secondly, that uh, the, the argument that you can isolate efficiency from all these other questions seems to me also ideological. And uh, let me emphasize, my criticism is not that my colleagues have ideology. It's that they accuse me of having ideology while pretending they have none. I don't know, this somebody else controlling. 
I have the microphone, so maybe I should ask a question. Um, I have like a not very well-defined criticism of your criticism. It seems that you are teaching. So, so the course you're teaching, it seems to be that they that the course is taken by sociology majors, by social studies majors predominantly. But it seems that the people who define what modern economics is are not people here in the room. They're not history majors uh, or like even PhD students. They are economics PhD students or your colleagues in the department. So I wonder how much or like what, what would you think is a strategy to actually change economics from within as opposed to from, like we know that all the departments in like all other departments don't have like in market-centered um, ideology as you think the economics department has. I'm sorry, but, I, I didn't understand your okay, question. Okay, so, so my criticism is, uh, or my question is, how do you think you can actually change economics given your criticism? Because oh, it seems I that you, you, you're okay. preaching to the people who aren't convinced by their ideology anyway, whereas like the economics profession seems no, to be very isolated from the criticism that you have been No, people take my course for lots of reasons. Uh, there are some who come from because of uh, ideological convictions. I have to say there's some who come who don't want to do economics at all, but mommy and daddy are paying the bills, and mommy and daddy think they should have a course in economics, and my course is one semester instead of two, so that's very attractive. So a lot, you know, they come and, and they get out of it different things. So um, you know, I, I, it's, um, and some, it's very gratifying because a lot of people say, look, I, you know, I didn't get any of this. I didn't know what I was getting in for, but I really learned uh, something. And, um, how we change economics is uh, that the economy has to change and the polity has to change because uh, the barons who ran the Harvard Economics Department in 1935, 1936, 1945, uh, well, by 1945 it was actually changing. Uh, let's stick to 1935 and 1936. We're no more sympathetic were no more sympathetic to the ideas of Keynes, the critique that was coming uh, from uh, Keynes or any other critique, than the barons of the department today are sympathetic to any of the critiques that I voiced. No. What changed is the polity. What changed was there was a political movement, and the economics department had to respond to it. So that's how it'll change. As I, you know, I, I don't want to say ideas are a dime a dozen. I don't want to devalue myself or anybody else. I don't think they're a dime a dozen. But what I'm trying to say to you is that ideas are one part of it. But the other part of it, that's, if you will, the seeds. But the other part of it is the soil and the weather, which will make those seeds germinate and grow into healthy plants. And that comes from, political, from the political side, from political movement. Um, I just want to stress uh, the opposite side of that last point you made. I worked here 25 years in the library system, and at certain key points, the economic uh, constructs that you're talking about in neoclassical economics or neoliberal economics really hits home. I was a supporter of the living wage occupation in 2001, and I would estimate based on all the things I was involved in and the students wearing buttons and so on, that about 60 to 65 percent of the students supported the living wage demand. People like Manicue weighed in with op-eds in the Boston Globe, speeches in their classes, and so on. And I saw that turn over the course of just two weeks, two or three weeks. So that appeal to authority had, had real power here. And I'll give one last, one other quick example. I wor I've worked in the library system for 25 years. Right now where I work, everything that's happening to us, which two years ago was hundreds of us laid off, or over 100 laid off, uh, the degradation of the standards of research in the library system. And right now, another ch uh, um, sort of reorganization happening, one of about three or four I've suffered through, where layoffs are being threatened again. And all of this is justified. And right now, by the way, uh, any new positions that come up are only term positions. This is a Harvard thing for you're only hired for one year. So try to plan your future on that. And also, uh, people are uh, you know, being told, well, you're just going to have to get ready for these big changes that are coming down. And my point is that everything is backed up by buzzwords from neoclassical economics, if not direct references to articles written by people like Manicure and so on. So this stuff really has an effect. And I hope that faculty like yourself and others will weigh in, try to get involved in, in, in stopping sort of a steamroller that's hitting a lot of workers here. 
uh, in my union, the clerical workers union, and things that have just happened recently on campus. Thanks. Thank you.